taking the student session of Florida Shines Virtual College Night. My name is Kendra Parson, and I will be facilitating the Virtual College Night webinar. First, let me say we are so excited to connect with you all this evening. Before we get started, I want to go over a few items with you. If you have questions, please put them in the chat section, and we will address them after the session if time allows or in a follow-up email. Closed captioning is provided. Tonight's session is being recorded and will be posted to our website, floridashines.org, along with any material shared. Finally, we are live on Twitter, so feel free to share your comments and connect with us at FLShines. Now, let's begin our second session of the evening, focusing on you, the student. First, we have Julie Richardson to discuss student success and tra transitioning to college. Julie currently serves as the Associate Director of Admissions at Florida State University and has worked in college admissions for the past 10 years. Working at a variety of different types of colleges and universities has provided her with insight to reviewing college applications in many ways. Her true passion is helping guide prospective high school students, parents, and guidance counselors through the admission process, which makes Julie the perfect person to walk us through this first session. Welcome, Julie. Hi, Kendra. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So my first set of slides is going to cover the admissions overview in a College 101. College preparation should start at the beginning of high school, and there are many things to consider when applying to college. It's important for students to prepare themselves academically as well while they are in high school. Today I'm going to discuss the various steps students and parents should take to prepare themselves for the college admissions process. There are many items to consider when researching colleges and universities. In addition, it's important that students and parents are mindful of the choices that they make as well as selecting high school coursework that they decide to take throughout high school. Um, today I'm going to talk and walk through kind of a timeline of 9th through 12th grade and the different steps I suggest that students and parents take. And then I'm also going to talk about um, different types of college admissions processes, and then I have a few minutes at the end for questions if anyone has any. So starting in ninth grade, the first thing I recommend is being mindful of your coursework. Believe it or not, any courses that you take for college or high school credit, which could even include courses in middle school, are going to be reviewed in your college application. So it's important to make sure once you start your Algebra 1s, your Spanish 1s, um, which could be in as early as 8th grade, sometimes 7th grade, but typically more so ninth grade, that coursework is being reviewed and those grades as well are being reviewed. So we're looking at coursework throughout high school, so ninth through 12th grade, so just be mindful that that is important, and it is important to do well in those courses. The other item I'm going to ask you to start doing in ninth grade um, is to start looking at different colleges and universities um, across the state. There's a variety of different universities. Um, you may even look outside of the state, depending on what it is you want to study. Um, primarily, you should be able to find what you want to study in the state of Florida, but there are many different types of institutions, so it's important for you to look and see what is out there. Typically, we also recommend in ninth grade, it's important for you to go ahead and get involved. This is the point when you want to start joining clubs, sports, volunteering, possibly getting a job. This is going to become helpful later when you start your college application process because looking at college applications is not just about academics. It's also about what you do outside of the classroom, so making sure that you're starting to get involved and you're not waiting until the last minute. The other item in the summer, we want you to maximize your summer. So this is a great time for students to just kind of start exploring different career fields. Maybe try to set up an internship in an area that you're interested in um, to find out more about that specific job. You may find that it's not something you actually like to do, um, and it's a good way for you to just really start exploring and seeing what types of jobs are out there or career paths um, to begin your college process. In 10th grade is really when students should start exploring their majors and also start looking at admissions requirements. This is when you want to start seeing what types of majors are out there. Um, you know, it's a little bit different when you go to college from high school. There are 
hundreds of different things that you can study. And in high school, you're on a pretty specific track. So it becomes much more obscure, and there's a lot to take into consideration. Um, I do usually recommend to students, Florida State has an amazing academic guide that's actually going to give a full breakdown of every major that we have on our campus. And it's going to include the coursework that you would take over four years for that specific major. And I tell students a lot of times, you know, I think many students who sometimes want to study um, to be, say, a nurse, don't necessarily understand how much biology and chemistry goes along with that, um, or possibly math. And so looking at some of those breakdowns may help you determine what you may want to study when you do go to college. So it's important to make note of that. And also start looking at what are those admissions requirements. You want to make sure that you're staying on track to meet the requirements of the schools that you want to go to. Um, if you don't meet those requirements, then that be can, can become an issue later. In 10th grade, you still have the opportunity to increase your curriculum, so you can take additional coursework you may need. You may be able to challenge yourself by taking honors courses or AP classes, possibly dual enrollment, um, and helping boost your GPA as well. So that's something you need to be mindful of in 10th grade. Your counselor is probably going to set you all up to take the PSAT, but that's typically when students will go ahead and take the PSAT. Moving into 11th grade, I've broken that down um, a little bit to kind of 11th grade and then what to do kind of over the summer. So in 11th grade, you will start taking the SAT and ACT. Typically, um, the one thing I cannot stress enough is test and test again. And I think students sometimes laugh at me when I say that. But And also try to take the SAT as well as the ACT. They're two very different tests, and every student is different. Um, most institutions accept both scores, um, and you may or probably are going to do better on one versus the other. And you're not going to know unless you try both. So it's really important that you go ahead and take both exams to find out which one is better suited for you and to stick with that and continue testing on that exam. In 11th grade, you're also going to want to start narrowing down your college choices. So earlier, we started making that list of what are your top schools or schools that you're interested in. In 11th grade, you're going to want to start narrowing that down so that way you know which schools you're planning on to apply for your 12th grade once you're your senior. Um, by narrowing that list, there are a lot of different ways to do that. One thing I like to recommend to students is for the student themselves to make a list of what's important for them when they go to college. Um, what are what I call must-haves. Um, so that may be having a certain major, so going to a certain school that has a specific major. It could be certain research opportunities that an institution will have. It could be playing a sport. It could be a variety of different things. Um, and it's important to know what the university offers academically as well as what they offer outside of the classroom because when you go to college, it's a four-year experience where you will be living there and you will be involved in many different types of things. And you want to make sure you're selecting a school that's fitting your academic goals. So when you graduate from college, what are, what are you hoping to gain? So it's important to make note of that early on even when you are still in high school. At the end of your 11th grade, you're going to go ahead and set your senior schedule. And I know I talk to students all the time, and they say, oh, I've made it to senior year. This is it. You know, the end is near. I'm, I'm ready to go to college. But they forget sometimes that your schedule is still really important. We still want to see you take strong academic courses throughout your senior year. That includes math, even though you may have already met the requirement to graduate it's still important for you to still challenge yourself and prepare yourself for that college curriculum that you're going to enroll in later. Um, and also, too, some of the coursework you may be taking may transfer as college credit, whether that's an AP course or an IB class or dual enrollment. It's going to follow you to that specific institution, and it's important for you to make sure you're taking the right courses and not just taking elective classes because you've met your graduation requirements. So that's something that we really like to see. And it's important to know that it's also important to do well your senior year. Even though you, when you're applying to most colleges and universities, you may not have your senior year grades yet to share with those institutions, but they may follow up with you later on after you have graduated and decided to enroll. So it's important that you still do well your senior year and are successful in the coursework that you decide to take. 
In 11th grade over your summer, one of the things I encourage many families to do is go ahead and visit colleges. Now, a lot of times I see some families, they'll go ahead and start visiting any time in 11th grade. Honestly, any time is a good time, but typically summer is an easier time for families because students are out of school, you're on summer break, you may end up going to certain colleges while you're traveling for your summer vacations and things like that. So it's important to go ahead and visit your campuses of the colleges and universities you're interested in. I always know visiting a college campus is very different than researching that institution online because you actually are having face-to-face -face time with the faculty and staff and the current students that are enrolled at that university. And typically within probably the first 20 minutes or so, a student usually knows whether or not this is a good fit for them. They can identify with the people that they're interacting with, if they, it just feels right sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't feel right, and that's okay too. And that's why it's important to go ahead and visit the schools that you're interested in to find out whether or not it is a right fit for you or not before you decide to enroll. The next item over the summer is to go ahead and start making a calendar you're gonna to want to use this calendar to outline when your college application deadlines are. This is gonna help keep you organized your senior year and hopefully alleviate some stress. So over the summer, you should be doing research about the requirements of the admissions to the certain institutions you plan to apply to, as well as setting out a timeline of when is their application deadline? Do they have a priority deadline? What does that mean? Um, do they have scholarship deadlines? Those are things to be make sure you know what those are. Now, in the summer, typically most universities will have their websites updated. If for some reason someone does not, please don't hesitate to call us. Um, you know, we're really here to help you, and if it's not on our website, we probably internally know an estimated time frame or can give you that information over the phone. So it's important for you to also reach out to us as well. The other item I recommend for students is to go ahead and create a college application email address for a few reasons. Typically, most students in high school are applying to between seven and 12 different colleges and universities when, they, when they're trying to make their decision on where they would like to go to school. That's a lot of different places, and they're sending you a lot of different information. It's easier for you to keep track of all of your college application progresses as well as items you may be missing from your application by having that email account, and also making sure that that account is uh, an email name that is an, a professional email name. That's also a reflection of who you are as an applicant. So that's one way for you to stay organized as well as have a professional appearance for the colleges you are applying to. Now in 12th grade, for those students that I talk to who don't typically go ahead and make that timeline or make that calendar, Sometimes they tend to get a little stressed out. So one thing I recommend for students, and you can do this in the summer as well, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and retest again. Regardless, even if you have tested well your junior year, testing again in the fall once or twice is beneficial for your application for many reasons. It, if you've tested really well, it may bump you to a scholarship level um, for your application, and who doesn't want to miss out on a scholarship? Um, the other thing is you just, there's always room for improvement. So that could give you different opportunities that may make or break whether or not you get admitted to another institution. Um, so typically I recommend students go ahead and test in the fall. Most of the time we're seeing students senior year testing in September, October, November, and December. Many times in the spring, it sometimes can be too late, not for all institutions, but I do recommend that you do go ahead and plan ahead and also request that we are an automatic recipient of those test scores. Then you're going to go ahead and make sure you meet your deadlines for your college application, so applying for admission. You can also send your items for your application in at various times. All items do not need to be received by or on that specific deadline. So most college applications open, I would say probably mid-August to early September. So you can go ahead, I would say early deadlines typically are in late October or early November. You can go ahead and start those applications in September and slowly add your items to your application to make it complete. Don't rush and try to do it all in a day. That's gonna be very hectic for you and if you wait and try to do that, it's probably a lot of your deadlines are gonna fall right around the same time and that's gonna become stressful. 
The next item is going to be completing your financial aid. Our FAFSA is now available on, in October, so we're recommending students include that in their application process. Next is the waiting game, so deciding or finding out when you've been admitted to students. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second, um, about the different types of admissions processes. Um, but once you've been admitted to an institution, the last item is making that final decision. And typically, what I tell students is visit your top school again for a second time. Go to an accepted student's day. This is going to be a different type of visit that's geared towards accepted students, and it's going to give you a different perspective and help you make your final choice of where you want to enroll. Now, the two different types of college admissions. So one is rolling admission. This is where applicants are reviewed in the order in which they become, become complete. Students then receive a decision as soon as one's available. So that could be in a few days. It could be in a few weeks um, as far as rolling admission goes. Now, deadline notification admission is when applications are reviewed in cohorts. All students who meet a specific deadline receive a decision on a predetermined date. Um, so that's partially what you need to research and find out what type of admission process is each institution that you're interested in applying for um, on, so that way you know when you should expect to receive a decision as well as when you need to meet your deadline. My final call to action for everyone is to do your research. Make sure you find out um, what your timeline is, what you need to do. Plan ahead. Um, and lastly, ask questions. Most of the information you need to know is on the admissions website of the school you're interested in. Review this early so you don't miss a deadline. Um, and if you don't see an answer to your question, make sure to give us a call. Like I said earlier, we're here to help you. Um, so make sure you give us a call and answer any, to ask any questions you may have about our specific process. Now my next question is, does anyone have questions for me? I know I have only about a minute here left. Thanks so much, Julie. Actually, we've had a few questions come in. So I'm just going to start with the first one, and we'll see how many we can take. So one is we've had a student ask how extracurricular activities, especially band, can help them in college. Sure. So as far as what you want to study now, you may be a music student or you may just enjoy being in band. Um, you know, those are things that we like to see students are trying things outside of the classroom. And sometimes some students find one thing and they just like doing that one thing, and that's okay. But we want to see you doing other things besides just academics. Because as I talked about earlier, going to college is not just about taking classes. It's about being involved in learning new things, and that's going to help build and shape your career opportunities um, throughout, high, or throughout college. So it's important for you, regardless if it's band or any other activities, that's going to help build upon what you're going to continue doing when you go to college. Okay, great. So um, another great question that we had is um, get about dual enrollment. Can you tell us how that can help um, with the application and, and admissions process? Sure. So this may be more than we have enough time to talk about, but dual enrollment is a, is a way for students to take college coursework. In many cases, it may be offered right at your high school, and you receive that college credit that will then follow you to the institution you decide to enroll in. In the state of Florida, dual enrollment is a great thing because Florida is on a common course numbering system. So if you take a course at a state institution, it will transfer to any state institution in the state of Florida. The one thing that I caution students about dual enrollment, especially at Florida State, or those interested in Florida State, is that GPA that you're building while you are in high school taking that college coursework is going to follow you to college. So I cannot stress enough that it's so important that if you decide to take a dual enrollment class that you do well in that course or courses that you decide to take um, because that's going to transfer with you and it may be your starting GPA at that specific institution. So it's just be mindful of the coursework that you're taking um, and knowing what your limits are and to make sure that you're going to be successful in those courses. Okay, so I think we're going to try and squeeze time for one more question. Um, so how do AP classes help high school students transition or prepare to college? So an AP level course is taught at a higher level 
and it's a more challenging coursework that you would traditionally see at a college or university. So taking AP classes is a stronger curriculum. It's going to help prepare you for the, your college curriculum um, and helpfully ease that transition of what the expectation is from high school to college as far as the homework assignments, things that need to be completed, the type of work that you're doing, et cetera. The other benefit of taking AP courses is you also can receive college credit from these as well. Um, Florida State and I think many other state universities have an accelerated credit guide on our website. So for those of you who are interested to see what type of courses would transfer from your high school, whether you take AP, dual enrollment, dual enrollment, ACE, or IB coursework, that is all transferable credit and can follow you um, when you do go to college. And we do have a breakdown on our website of the score that you would need on the exam for that and what course credit you would receive. Okay, so thank you so much. We have a lot more questions um, coming in, um, more than we have time to answer. So we are going to follow up with everyone individually. Um, so thank you so much, Julie. Um, I think we all have a better understanding than when we came here today and know now a lot, a lot more questions to ask too. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and move forward with um, Thomas Foe. He's going to lead our next session in paying for college. Thomas um, has more than 20 years' experience in financial aid. He started in 1996 in the Loan Guarantee Origination Division of the Pens Pennsylvania Higher Education Association Agency. He currently serves as president-elect of the Florida Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, he is the Director of Financial Aid Services for the State College of Florida at Manatee, Sarasota, um, and he possesses a bachelor's degree in marketing from Penn State University and is an MBA candidate from University of South Florida. So please welcome Mr. Vo. Thank you, Kendra, and thank you, Julie, for a uh, great presentation to, to kick us off. I appreciate everyone being uh, online and uh, after, I'm sure, a long day of school and practices and extracurricular activity, and uh, it's great to know that you are taking such interest in your college education and career. We'll get started, there's a lot of slides today, um, but I'm gonna move through them fairly swiftly and quick, and there should be some time for questions afterwards. So this is just basic, basic information, what you need to know about financial aid. Um, I want you all to be aware of a couple of things. First off, cost of attendance budget. When you guys actually receive your financial aid award from your college, you're probably gonna see something called a cost of attendance budget. What that is, is the budget that the financial aid office sets up for students that attend there. Regulations based upon Department of Education state that you cannot receive financial aid that exceeds cost of attendance budget. Now your cost of attendance budget is not just your tuition and fees. They take into consideration books, supplies, transportation, uh, cost of living, it's, um, direct and indirect costs, and it varies widely from college to college. When you fill out your FAFSA, which I uh, understand there's a separate session for the uh, FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, and this is the federal application that you must complete each year. The FAFSA, when you complete it, will give you an EFC number. That's your expected family contribution. Schools use this to determine your eligibility for need-based forms of financial aid, whether it be grants, scholarships, work study, or even some loans. And we'll talk about what's available out there shortly. So the FAFSA will ask questions about yourself and your parent, um, and then you'll get an EFC, and that's a constant. It stays, stays the same no matter what college you attend. With financial aid offices, uh, I went over a cost of attendance and expected family contribution. The cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution then determines your financial need. That's what we in financial aid office are going to try to help you obtain in various sources of financial aid to help you pay for your college education. And our various types of financial aid uh, is broken down into two categories, gift aid and self-help aid. Obviously, gift aid is just uh, it's a form, it's a gift basically. You don't have to do anything or contribute towards it. Your self-help aid is stuff that you may have to contribute, whether it be working or loans that you have to pay back. Now with gift aid, scholarships, that's money that doesn't have to be paid back. Scholarships can be awarded on various criteria, merit, skill, or some unique characteristic. Your grants, similar to scholarships, that's money that does not have to be paid back. This is usually awarded on the basis of financial need. So when students fill out a FAFSA or there may be even another application, 
Schools determine your financial need and award grants based upon need. Now, your loans, these are money that students and parents borrow to help pay college expenses. Uh, repayment of these loans usually will begin after you obtain your degree and your education is finished. The biggest thing I can recommend for students is only borrow what is needed. Uh, I don't want to deter students or tell you all not to take out student loans. Sometimes you must. But just keep in mind that student loans are an investment in the future, so if you must take it, feel free to do so, but borrow wisely. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's a growing, a growing issue in the, in the U.S. There's lots of student loan debt, and so it's something I can't stress, in, stress enough. Financial aid also stress this. If you can see some statistics here, and again, I'm not trying to scare you. I just want you to be aware to stress borrow wisely. Right now, U.S. student loan debt, $1.26 trillion, and 44.2 million Americans have student loan debt. Average monthly payment is $351. Um, right now, I'll tell you, that's about mine, and I've been paying over 20 years. Um, so, you know, but uh, my education was worth it, and so I will deter you from taking out student loans. Sometimes it's necessary. Um, and then just continue on with a few statistics there. I won't go through them all. Now, continuing on with your self-help aid, uh, there is some work study or employment opportunities available. Now, this is a form of need-based aid. When you fill out your FAFSA, there will be a question on there to ask if you're interested in work study. What work study is, is employment at on-campus offices, like you know, admissions, financial aid, the library, the gym, different offices on campus or clubs, or off-campus at nonprofit organizations. These are actually jobs that actually uh, you'll get a paycheck, most likely, or a stipend. The good thing about federal work study is that we understand the employer, the school, understands that your studies come first. So there's flexible scheduling, flexible schedule studies, so you can study for your exams uh, or you can do your homework accordingly. And the good thing about work study is you can get some good experience and what and maybe decide upon a career. Um, there are plenty of places off campus and nonprofit organizations. Myself, for example, I actually had no clue what I wanted to do. And then back over 20 years ago, I was a work study student in financial aid. Never planned on, on financial aid as a career, but I stayed in it this long. So there's opportunities out there and uh, certainly to at least help you fund your education through work. Now, sources of financial aid. The largest source is the federal government. We'll go through all these quickly, um, but the, the federal government is the largest one, and that's derived through the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It is awarded primarily on the basis of financial aid, and you must apply each year using the FAFSA, again, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, the FAFSA. Your federal student aid programs, these are the most common ones I put on here. Your federal Pell Grant, that's the largest grant that's available out there. That's available on need based upon that EFC number, your expected family contribution number that you get from the FAFSA. Um, what you can do if you're interested, when you get your EFC number, um, when you complete your FAFSA, at the very, very end of that FAFSA, if you have an EFC number, it'll tell you whether or not you're eligible for federal Pell Grant. It'll also tell you whether or not possibly you're eligible uh, the max you can borrow for student loans on there. So you're eligible for a Pell Grant when you fill out your FAFSA. It'll state the max you're eligible for based upon full-time enrollment. Now, colleges also have their limited funds that they receive from the Department of Education. One of those is the FSEOG, the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. These schools determine the awarding based upon most likely need and the date you apply. So it's always important to get your FAFSA in early, as quick as possible. Schools have priority application deadlines. So it's important you understand when the deadline is and get it in early enough so you can be considered for such things like federal work study and FSEOG, the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. If you're eligible for a federal Pell Grant, you may be eligible for the SEOG. That's why it's considered supplemental. We'll cover loans in, in a little bit as well, sub, uh, subsidized and unsubsidized, um, and the federal plus loan. Uh, your state's uh, residency requirements uh, apply on that. Here's the website, floridastudentfinancialaid.org, SSFAD slash BS, BS standing for Bright Futures. Now, you can get more information 
from a guidance counselor, certainly they can help you, or any financial aid office. Uh, the deadline to apply is by August 31st after your high school graduation. Colleges and universities, they award aid on the, on the basis of both merit and, and need. As I mentioned, there's priority application deadlines. They have their own funds. A lot of colleges and universities have a foundation where they award their own funds in the form of scholarships. Uh, reach out to those financial aid offices. Reach out to those um, foundation offices. Find out what the deadlines are. There's different applications. There may be different supplemental documentation you must provide. Just make sure you're aware of the requirements and the deadlines by the institution. Those that belong to civic organizations and churches, feel free to reach out to those organizations like that. There may be some scholarships that are available and they have their, their own criteria. The biggest advice I can tell students is small scholarships add up. Don't be afraid to apply for a $100 scholarship, a $250 scholarship, et cetera. You get four of those, now you have possibly $1,000 or extra. It can cover books. It can cover more than that. So feel free to put in the work. There are a lot of unclaimed scholarships that students just don't get because they don't apply. If somebody tells me, if you invest 10, 15 minutes to fill out an application, maybe write an essay, and you could get $250, $1,000. Well, that's a good return on the time that you put into it. So definitely put in the time and fill out the applications and put in the time to apply. Your employers or your parents' employers may have some scholarships available. I know FedEx has one, McDonald's. Um, there's different organizations. Have your parents check or even yourself if you work with the Human Resources Department. There may be scholarships as um, as employees of a company. Private sources, um, there's foundations, businesses, organizations, just local organizations within your area may have scholarships, local banks may have a scholarship. Just begin researching early, now's the time. There's various deadlines and criteria. The biggest thing I will also stress with, with scholarships and the application process is avoid scams. There are scam organizations out there that will charge you to apply for a scholarship. If you think about it, you're looking to get free money to pay for your education. Why should you pay money to get free money? It's counterproductive. It doesn't make any sense to do so. The very bottom of this slide, fastweb.com, that's a website that the Department of Ed and many financial aid offices endorse. It's a great scholarship database. You can just do a search, put in different criteria, and you can see now's the time. Like I said, research it, apply early. You can start researching now. A couple more things I just want to stress with you all. Um, when you get to college, in order to maintain your eligibility for federal student aid, you need to be aware of something called satisfactory academic progress when you're enrolled. Each school is required to mandate this. This is based upon the Department of Ed. It's a federal law, federal rule. Students must be doing well at college, matriculating, performing decent with their grades in order to continue to receive federal student aid Overall, um, there's different criteria set by the school. The main thing I want you to be aware of when you look research this, it's on financial aid websites. It's uh, also on the school's website. You can just Google it on the or do a search on the website. It's called staff or status academic progress. You must maintain a minimum GPA, overall GPA, as determined by the school. You must maintain a pace progression, meaning that schools will require you to pass a certain percentage of the courses. Once you take classes, you may be able to drop, withdraw, or you may be dropped from courses or fail courses, unfortunately. Things happen. Just make sure that you understand the completion rate. A lot of schools set it roughly around 67%. So once you start the classes, if you drop or you fail, it's considered a failed attempt. This is cumulative. Overall, your career, while you're in school, you must meet minimum standards. If you fail to meet them, you could be suspended from your federal student aid. Also take courses that are only applicable towards your degree. Degree. You're gonna, when you enroll, be asked for your major. If you're unsure of a major, there are some bachelor's undeclared, associate's undeclared. You wanna to try to declare something because federal regulations, if you receive federal student aid, you can only take courses towards that degree. That's all federal student aid will pay for. If you're taking a course that's not necessary for a degree, you will not be eligible for federal student aid. I know it's a lot of information, but it's, a lot of things you just need to be aware of to continue to maintain your benefit. 
budgeting. I know this is a small spreadsheet. I'll just tell you about it, really. While you're deciding what school you want to go to, you're going to receive different federal student federal awards or different financial aid award letters. You want to just try to create like a spreadsheet or just write one up. Understand that there are different costs to education and there are different awards you're going to receive. Some schools will have higher costs, but they may have more institutional scholarships and grants. So I would write a spreadsheet or, or something along those lines of, this is how much it's going to cost tuition, fees, books, travel, housing. This is how much I'm getting in financial aid. Okay, this is how much I may need to borrow in student loans, or this is how much mom and dad or myself will have to pay out of pocket. Compare costs and decide versus also the quality of education, what school is best for you. Make sure when you're uh, deciding upon what school and you also enroll, budget accordingly. Try to avoid credit cards unless necessary. Um, make sure you use financial aid monies for educational and cost of living expenses. When I was an 18-year-old, 19-year-old uh, freshman, you know, I, I enrolled at a, at a school and I, I took out student loans and I ended up getting a refund from the student accounts department. And you may get that, a refund check or a direct deposit. That money should go towards educational costs, whether it be books or, you know, meals or housing. Well, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't great at budgeting. I see this big check I got. I ended up going to spring break in Panama City. I bought gaming systems or laptops, and you know what? That was part of my student loan money that I pay now. And that's why I can't stress it enough. Make sure you budget accordingly, borrow what's necessary, only pay for, you know, educational-related uh, fees, things like that. But make sure you budget. Uh, it's not uncommon for an individual book for your class to cost more than $200, and some have price tags that go as high as $400. Um, and the College Board, which is the company that does studies on statistical figures, recommends that students budget about $1,200 a year for books and supplies. Now, uh, something you can do is definitely research. I know Amazon has textbook rental. A lot of your bookstores on college will have the opportunity to rent books instead of buy books. Research what's more cost efficient for you and your parents overall. I put this slide on here. We're not going to go over the FAFSA because I, I understand there's a separate session that goes in detail. But right now for the next year, 1718 FAFSA, it's available. This is brand new. As of October 1st, it was available. So you can actually fill your FAFSA now if you're planning on enrolling in the 1718 school year during this time frame, July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2018. And it's going to go off your 2015 taxes, yours and your parents. Now, just closing out, I get a lot of questions as a financial aid director in my office. A lot of students and parents will say, well, the parents are unable to contribute towards the, the, the student's cost of their education. Or the student will say, well, I'm going to get my own housing or I'm going to commute and pay for my own costs. Shouldn't I be an independent student? My parents aren't going to help me. The Department of Ed has a regulation that they're going to ask you questions during your FAFSA. Unless you meet one of the following criteria, you're considered a dependent student and your parents' information must be included on the FAFSA. Unless you're over the age of 24, you're married, you have a child or a dependent, you provide more than 50% of support, you're a veteran of the uh, military, um, you're active duty, you're an orphan or a ward of the court, you're homeless, or you're deemed to be independent due to a special circumstance by the financial aid office, unfortunately, you are going to be required to have parents' information on the fast unless you're independent by one of those standards. And my last information, my last slide, I want you all, all to be aware of that uh, we in the financial aid office, we're here to help you. We know that situations come across, come up that you may need additional sources of funding or something happens along the way, unfortunately, where mom or dad may have lost their job or the information that they reported on the financial aid application of FAFSA is not the same as your current financial status now. Keep in good communication with the financial aid office. Understand that there's institutional funds, there's scholarships, there's grants. We want to help you. So feel free to reach out to us, contact us if you want to find out your status or there's additional documentation. We're certainly here to help you. There's some examples of changes in, of special circumstances, changes in income, employment status, things like that, unusual uh, costs overall. I know I went over this pretty fast, um, but I think that's the most important point to regard to financial aid. Again, financial aid officers are, help you, are here to help you. If you have questions, contact them. Um, I'm not sure where we are on time, but uh, I'm available for questions. Are we okay or where are we at on that? So we, we are, we're running 
float short on time, and we did have lots of great com questions come in, so we'll definitely follow up individually. But I do want to ask one question, because I think we have time for one more. Um, so relating to the FAFSA, mm -hmm. how, can you tell us how early someone can apply and how to make changes on the FAFSA form? Sure. Um, you can apply now for the 17-18 year. It's avail it was available as of October 1st. So the students and parents can apply now for the 17-18 year, and you're going to use your 2015 tax return. Once, and the, the website is FAFSA.gov. That's the uh, free application for federal free application for federal student aid, FAFSA.gov. Um, once you complete the FAFSA, if you need to make changes, you can go on that website and make changes later if things, uh, if you know, your status changes. You, can, you and the parent can go online as long as you have your FSA user ID, which you'll register for a unique ID. Okay, great. So thank you so very much. Um, that you've definitely given us some great tips on on paying for college. So, like I said, there are several other questions, and we'll definitely follow up um, individually via email. Um, if if you do have uh, more questions relating to the FAFSA, or you would like more information. We will have a workshop dedicated to the FAFSA tomorrow afternoon beginning at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. If, if you guys are interested in participating um, in that, be sure to register on our website and, and, and try to register for that as soon as possible. Um, and that, that website is floridashines.org. So again, thank you, uh, Mr. Vo. And next we have Kimberly Noy to tell us about um, another great way to learn, the online experience. So Kimberly has worked at FIU for more than 10 years and currently serves as a student success coach and is a true Miami native. She completed her master's degree in higher education administration and has a professional certificate in event planning from FIU. Um, Kimberly, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kendra. Hi, everyone. Um, so my presentation is titled Online Learning, Assumptions, Realities, and Achieving Success. I hope that you enjoy it. Okay. So I wanted to start off with a poll to see how interested you are in online learning. So you will see a poll appear and you can select the answer that applies to you. I will also read the question as well. Uh, once you begin your academic program, how likely are you to A, take at least one online class, B, take multiple online classes, C, join a fully online program, or D, none of the above? So I'll go ahead and give you a couple of seconds for that. Okay, awesome. So thank you for your responses. And I'm sure that some of you have actually probably taken an online class before. Um, but it, it seems like you have indicated that you are interested in taking an online course. Um, some of you have indicated that you're not interested in taking an online course at all, and that's okay. Uh, my hope is that you'll have a better understanding of what online learning is like after this presentation, and that may pique your interest a little bit. So to begin, it's important to note that universities in Florida are looking to expand online learning because of its convenience, flexibility, and its ability to increase, I'm sorry, to increase access to students that may not be able to attend on-campus programs or classes. And because Florida universities are looking to expand online programming, there is a focused effort to provide a greater selection of online courses and programs and schools are implementing innovative tools designed to keep you engaged, active, and supported. Um, so you may be wondering what I mean by more support and innovative tools. The, the screenshot I have included is what a fully online psychology student would see when they log into Blackboard, which is the learning management system that we currently use at FIU Online. Uh, you can think of it as a centralized place you would go to access all of your online courses or maybe even hybrid courses. 
Um, so as you can see, the psychology students will have a customized banner. Um, there's different infographics and flyers that coaches are constantly updating and posting, providing psychology students with information that they need to know. Um, and we also include information from the department as well, just to make sure they're aware of everything um, that's important for their academic success. Uh, and institutions are implementing customized support because they want to use technology to make your experience as engaging as that of an on-campus student. Um, to give you an idea of how much online learning has been growing, here is what we have seen over the past three academic years at FIU Online. Uh, so we've seen a continuous growth in both students electing to take at least one online course and students that are participating in fully online programs. And we really anticipate that these numbers will continue to grow as they should be at other Florida institutions as well. So in all likelihood, you may end up taking an online course during your career at the institution you choose. So now that we have discussed how online learning is growing and what changes you can expect because of this growth, let's get into the assumptions that students often have about online learning. Uh, I included another poll because I'm interested to see how many of you have had these assumptions or maybe even still have them. So please select as many of the following assumptions that apply to you. You can select multiple ones. Um, A, online learning is easier than face-to-face -face learning. B, online learning does not require as much time. C, you will not have any support when you are participating in online learning. D, you will have minimal interaction with instructors or classmates. E, you will not have any due dates or F, none of the above. So go ahead and take a couple of seconds to select your responses. All right, thank you for that. Um, so based on your responses, I see that many of you have either heard of or perhaps just formed your own opinions of online learning, which is very common. Uh, this is actually a conversation that I have with my students at, all the time, really, as a student success coach. Um, many students join an online program thinking that things might be easier or that it'll take less time, but after taking an online course or maybe even a semester of online classes, they too often realize that things don't really match up to their assumptions. So here we have the realities of online learning. And these points are really, really important to understand when you're making the decision to take an online course, or more importantly, to commit to a fully online program, because you want to make sure that it's a good fit for you. Um, so number one, Online learning often does require more effort and attention than traditional face-to-face -face learning. When you're learning online, you will be tasked with completing many different types of assignments, um, such as uh, posting on discussion boards, responding to your peers, watching lectures, working collaboratively on wiki pages, um, putting together video posts, or working on group projects, just to name a few. Uh, so you do have to be aware of what assignments you have to complete and by what date and self-motivated to get it done in a timely fashion. A difference between online learning and face-to-face -face learning is, you know, when you have a class to attend at a certain time and date, nobody is, um, I mean, you might have a, a parent or a friend that might say, hey, you got to get to class, or maybe they'll remind you. Um, but when you're taking an online course, you don't have that same luxury because no one's going to remind you to log in for class. Um, so aside from being motivated, you'll also need to be willing to make sacrifices to make sure you're successful and spend adequate time on your schoolwork. Um, number two, you will need to spend extra time preparing for online courses to ensure you're able to stay on track. Um, at the beginning of the semester, you definitely do need to set aside quite a bit of time to make sure that you're organized and that you schedule when you'll be spending time working on your coursework and how you'll manage your workload. This will help you stay on track during the semester, especially when things get hectic towards the middle or end of the term. Um, you should be reflecting on work-life balance and determine how many hours per week you're comfortable working on schoolwork. 
Uh, understanding that number of hours that you're comfortable working on schoolwork will help you set a schedule that will work best for you. Um, and you should also solicit the help of your advisor when choosing your courses to make sure that you have a balanced schedule. For example, if you're taking three courses, you don't want to pick all high intensity courses that students tend to struggle with. Number three, there are innovative tools being utilized in online learning that make courses engaging and fun. So similarly to what we're doing now, a lot of professors are using technology such as Adobe Connect, Skype, uh, or other virtual meeting platforms to be more interactive with their students. They're recording lectures and PowerPoints with audio so that you can see and hear them. Uh, and they're also holding chat office hours with students and trying to find ways to connect with them on a more personal level. Um, professors are also assigning um, assignments such as video discussion board posts and um, responding using videos to help you connect with your classmates. And they're also incorporating a variety of group project tools that promote engagement with your peers. Number four, your professors, peers, and administrative staff will support you throughout your journey in online learning. Uh, like I mentioned before, Florida universities are spending more time and energy creating a virtual learning environment that will be both supportive and stimulating. So they're reaching, they're also providing more support staff such as academic advisors, success coaches, and um, other support staff to ensure that you have a go-to person to help you with important questions and topics related to your academic success. Uh, it's important to remember that while support staff are here to support you essentially, right, uh, you do have to do your part, which includes, you know, staying on top of your messages, um, making sure that you're checking your campus email, um, and just making sure that you're proactively trying to um, stay motivated and keep yourself informed. Um, and lastly, number five, you will have due dates for assignments, projects, and tests. I, I can't tell you how often I have students that are very shocked to find this out. Um, there are exceptions to this, but for the most part, you will have to adhere to deadlines for assignments. Um, but it is important to remember that online learning is very flexible. You can log into courses and complete your work whenever you want. I have students that work overnight to get the bulk of their coursework done then. Um, and that wouldn't be possible if the student was trying to complete the course in person. So understanding the assumptions and realities of online learning are critical to achieving success. But equally important is understanding how you as a student can set yourself up for success. Uh, below you will see some examples that my team sends out to students that helps them remember important tips for success throughout the semester. Um, we have identified that students that are most successful with online and all courses really are spending the time to master these strategies. Uh, the first one being creating your to-do list. The very first thing you should be doing on the first day of class is reviewing your syllabus in detail. Look at the various assignments you have to complete, identify important deadlines, and try to get a sense for what the course will be like and the preferences that your professor has. Uh, this is a great time to jot down any notes or questions that you might have, and you can also create this time to set goals for yourself and to create your to-do list. And that to-do list, to list is something that you should be continuously referencing throughout the semester. Keep in touch with your professors. Uh, use the first week of class to get to know your professors. A great way to start this is during the review of your course syllabus. Uh, you should think of the syllabus as a contract between you and your professor. So it's very important that you understand it and you know it like the back of your hand. Um, you should be thoroughly reviewing it before you make a commitment to stay in that particular course and work with that professor because, again, you know, if you have options, you want to make sure that it's a good fit. Um, a detailed review will also help you identify any questions you may have or if there could be any potential issues with your schedule or even with technology. And remember that throughout the semester, open communication with your professor is critical to your success. Know your schedule. Uh, when planning your school schedule, you should be thinking about what your days and weeks look like. Break down each day and think about when you, could fit a, when you can fit in um, study time. Often I see students and I have conversations with my students that sign up for four or five online courses. And when we take a look at their schedule and break it down, the student actually will end up realizing that they have 
two to three free hours a day to devote to studying, which is not nearly enough time for that number of classes. So remember that online learning is often more demanding than traditional face-to-face -face learning. Factor in the things that you have to do, like work or maybe helping your family with tasks and things that you like to do, like playing sports or hanging out with friends to make sure that you don't overcommit yourself. Finally, uh, stay positive. Make sure to incorporate time for self-care. This is so important. Um, this is what's gonna help you not get burned out, whether you're taking an on-campus course or an online course. Um, so that means finding time to do the things that you like to do, things that are good for your body and mind. It, maybe it's something like soccer, running, yoga, or playing brain exercise games, whatever it is that you enjoy. Just make sure that you're able to do it because that's what's gonna help you stay positive throughout the semester. As I mentioned before, being an online student does not mean you will be working independently and that you'll never communicate with anyone. You will definitely have a support network at the institution that you're at. Um, it's important to identify the support network and this will help you ensure that you have the support and resources you need while you complete your class or degree online. Um, below you'll see some of the support network resources coaches send to their students at FIU online. Those are just some examples. Um, but similar to FIU, your institution will have various support staff members that will help guide you throughout your educational journey, such as academic advisors, uh, student success coaches, and financial assistance representatives that can help answer questions you have about financial aid or paying for your tuition. Um, you should be communicating with these representatives on a frequent basis to make sure you're on the right track. I have students that tell me, you know, I haven't spoken to my advisor in a couple of semesters and I always encourage them to reach out to the advisor. Um, coaches also promote various free resources to students like browser or cell phone applications that make it easier to connect with your peers and to complete group work, which is something that you'll undoubtedly see in an online course. Um, and again, we're always promoting that frequent communication with professors because we know that students tend to shy away from emailing questions that they have, um, which is so weird because, you know, if you think about it like this, if you have a question in course, in, in, in class, excuse me, you would raise your hand and ask it. So if you're taking an online class, sending a message to your professor by email is essentially the same thing. So don't be afraid to ask. Your institution will also have free resources that you can tap into that will help you achieve success academically and help you grow as an individual. Uh, at FIU Online, there is free online tutoring, writing resources, and a distance learning librarian that helps support fully online students whenever they need help with research. Um, through our Blackboard Learning Environment, we have modules that include research activities, and quizzes related to time management and personal development, among other topics. Of course, it's up to you as a student to take advantage at the, of, of these, I'm sorry, excuse me, to take advantage of these types of resources and proactively seek them out at the institution that you're at. In addition to your support network and free resources, your institution will undoubtedly have virtual involvement opportunities that you can participate in as an online student. At FIU, we have student organizations that are online friendly and make accommodations to have online students join. Um, and we also have student programming that was developed from existing on-campus programs and tailored for online students. Uh, so if you're interested in being an online student but still want to try and stay involved with the institution, just make sure to ask about what virtual opportunities are available to you. To recap, achieving success with online courses requires hard work and dedication. Aside from understanding the realities of online learning, always remember to proactively identify and reach out to key support staff members, such as advisors and success coaches. Uh, also proactively ask about free resources that the institution offers that are online friendly and continuously work to master your tips for success, which include learning your syllabus and creating a to-do list, communicating with your professors, creating a detailed schedule, and staying positive. Don't forget to ask about ways you can get involved and how you can work on personal development along the way. And finally, and most importantly, take ownership of your experience and hold yourself accountable to the goals that you set. 
which is one of the most important aspects of being successful with your courses. Um, so that wraps up my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope that I have given you a better understanding of what you can expect when you take an online class or participate in an online program at a Florida institution. Um, if you're still feeling unsure or have any follow-up questions, you can feel free to reach out to me at the email address I have provided and I would love to help. Um, and finally, if you're still on the fence about online learning, I encourage you to just try it out because it is a great opportunity and a very unique learning experience. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we, we did have uh, some questions come in. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to answer them. Um, so we will be following up individually um, follow, uh, at later, later on. Um, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us tonight, Kimberly. It, it, it was great to hear how accessible online classes are, and I think you've given everyone something to consider when selecting the, the right type of uh, learning environment and classes. Um, so this concludes the student session. Uh, next, uh, we will have the parent session. Don't forget about our hands-on workshops tomorrow, focusing on My Career Shines planning tools, FAFSA, your gateway to financial aid, and Complete Florida Adult Learners Back to School Basics. As a reminder, you will receive a follow-up email with a survey that we hope you will complete. All presentations and materials shared will be posted on our website, floridashines.org. For additional information, please email us at collegenight at flvc.org, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at flshines. Our next session, Parent Focus, will begin at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you. <laughs>